great to be here, Clay. Good to good to be with you in person. Again, yes. After the wonderful NATO youth summit, yeah, it was really worth our time. It was good. Yeah, great, great experience, <laughs> right, guys? Yeah, yeah, it was good actually. I enjoyed it. The Brussels, I think the Brussels end. Was... Yeah, the waffles. Actually, I didn't have any waffles, but they looked good. But I had the uh, Belgian fries. Yeah, they were good, and uh, some Belgian beers as well. Mm. I don't know. Are you a fan of Belgian beer? Uh, probably not. I don't. Th- I don't really think so. Like the the really wheaty things, yeah. too full. The the American IPAs are a bit better. I like a good fruity. IPA? You would. Yeah. I like found out the other... sour. <laughs> Apparently IPA was made because we couldn't... The, well, us Brits, when we were doing some stuff over in India, we couldn't get beer over there. So we had to make beer that would travel far. I didn't realize Is that. Is that right? Yeah, supposedly. I, I know that uh, the gimlet was invented to give Navy sailors or make them take their vitamin C rations. Okay. So they would cut vodka or gin i think it was gin at the time with um lime juice mm-hmm. to make sure they didn't get scurvy at sea and there was no other way like like you're not going to eat a lemon or a lime <laughs> so it was like if you put it in your booze then we will be sure that the sailors will yeah will drink their measure i thought that was pretty good first cocktail was a genuine medicine wow the things you learn as a diplomat yeah <laughs> i think i probably did learn it as a diplomat I think, I think that's actually quite a good segue for uh, imperialism <laughs> while we're on that subject. So you're from Australia. <laughs> I am. You're an Australian diplomat. I was. Uh, I was. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Um, what do you want to know? How did you get started? Like, how did you... Uh, so I, I, I was a lawyer before. Um, so I was a couple of years out of law school. And then uh, it's always been a dream, I guess, to kind of be a diplomat. I didn't really have a sense of what they did. Um, and I don't know how your system is here. We're similar to the US in the sense that you're... You can go into a graduate program, which is designed to kind of train the next wave of ambassadors and, and like senior officials. But it's a fairly difficult mm-hmm. program to get into. You kind of like apply and do tests. And then over a year or so, they kind of whittle it down. I think there's like 5,000 applications and 30 get in, which is the same as the State Department. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just applied and was successful. I mean, realistically, like I think it takes you have to be qualified to get down to the like final couple of hundred and then beyond that it's just kind of like getting lucky but then you must have been actually quite qualified because you weren't posted anywhere now you went to china yeah china i went to china yep i um so you do a couple of years in the capital so canberra in the foreign ministry kind of Mm -hmm. you know i I think they would say that training training to be a diplomat really just kind of working on whatever they need you to work on drinking Um, beers drinking beers drinking ipa certainly cocktails yeah gimlets exactly um I was in the international legal division there, working on a lot of South China Sea stuff, um, maritime law, and then Antarctic law, and then got posted to China. So then did two years of language training, which was the best, by far mm. the best part of my 10 years in the foreign service. Fluent? Yeah. I um, mean, it's pretty rusty now, but I had a taxi driver. I live in Chicago and I had a taxi driver the other day who was Chinese and we had a conversation and I was like, oh, it's... Re, like you get a word and you kind of like I know what that word is and your brain just doesn't make that connection quite as quickly as you would like but I feel like once you get to a certain level of the language you never yeah lose it really so is that Mandarin uh-huh. do you know any Cantonese as well no I really don't at all they're okay. completely different are they trying to fa- phase out Cantonese in China am I right or they- I, ha- I don't know about phasing it out um, yeah. it's certainly like the secondary language it's not I think they've stopped teaching it I don't know. But I, I, in the south, I doubt it. Like Guangzhou, it speaks Cantonese. Like mm-hmm. you gotta, you gotta, they all have to learn Mandarin for sure. So I think maybe like over time, Mandarin will probably just become dominant and dominant and dominant. But, yeah. Um, On the topic of China, Biden recently called Xi a dictator, mm. and the only news headline I saw in response to it is New Zealand. Given Australia, very similar accents, very close how by. Do, how do you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um they're like totally not the case what's uh what what yeah i haven't seen her uh, the, the the pm's quote what did he say i've almost said her because new zealand's just a load of sheep right oh right. there you go yeah you can see it I've got over there i've got new zealand people we staying with us there. at the moment i like to, you got a what uh from family from new Ze- like some family friends from new zealand oh, yeah. staying at the moment yeah just Basically, call them sheep farmers. Good. Like, yeah. That's that's the polite version. There's only He's, five million people there. It's not like I a know, big. I know. It gets a bit. I don't know. Does it get more attention than it deserves? New Zealand. No, no, yes. Twenty Kiwis out. You're, you're asking an Australian. <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. They did have a lot to say about Australia. Although, sure. how many Australians <laughs> are there? Like twenty-eight million. Oh. Yeah. Roughly two. Pretty small compared to America. What uh, he said he mm-hmm. wouldn't characterize Ch- as a dictator. I can't see that. Oh, you can't see that. No nope. monitor. 
Um, he said, so I, I mean, no, in I mean, the form of government of China is up to the people. I mean, that's absurd. I like that's an absurd comment. Of course, Xi Jinping is a dictator. I don't think it's helpful to call him that. I don't think Joe Biden is particularly helpful in saying that out loud because it's. I mean, do you think that was a response to Blinken kind of being disrespected? I mean, if you look at, I mean, actually, that's interesting. So, as a diplomat, right? Like, there was a lot of. You see the that there was no pomp when nonsense. Blinken totally walked walked down and a sad trombone was played no. in the background. And it. then and then the meeting where instead of sitting side by side in two big comfy chairs, they're at like a big table and she's yeah. at the front. That's how they always deal with secretaries of state. That was But what about on Twitter where they showed three pictures that showed different That was that's people on Twitter who have no idea what they're talking <laughs> about, who have never worked in the field. They haven't I mean it, this stuff is debunkable by literally searching the last time a Secretary of State went to the uh to the China and to China they gave him exactly the same treatment. It's just it's just nonsense. It's online stuff. So the US people wasn't like embarrassed? You, Clay, people like you, Clay, trying to generate clicks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh no, I don't I don't think so. I think that I think it was a normal visit, completely normal. Um, and, and you know, I mean, it, it definitely came under a general environment of they don't like each other, but mm -hmm. the meetings were fine. Um, I think Joe Biden, I have no idea whether Joe, if this is like one of those carefully orchestrated moments to kind of... Or just a slip up. Say, yeah, or a slip up. But I don't, I personally don't think it's helpful to like have put a floor under the relationship, had a relatively good trip to China. And then a day later say. But didn't he come out before the Olympics and call what was going on in Xinjiang a genocide? Like at that point, like. So you just got to think, what's the, what are you achieving? there? Ex well, exactly. Like, and also then how do you have like a, or how do you then keep a relationship going with a country that you said had the genocide? Either then you were lying in the past or. Yeah, they're doing a genocide, but we need well, yeah, things you, made. You ha yeah, I mean, I think that's always a tension in, in diplomacy is that you... It, you Once it, you play the genocide card, it's really tough to... Well, no, you say you're engaging with the country even though they are what we believe they're doing is genocide because we believe we can influence them to not do it. You don't, you can't just, you can't just call it a genocide and then not talk to China. It's too big, right? And I don't, I actually don't think that's inconsistent. You can mm. sort of criticize but work with. But what I do think is odd is that you would run your mouth and call them a dictator, call him a dictator intentionally. Because I mean, what there is no strategic value to that that I can think of. Um, unless, it, unless you kind of want to make the relationship bad again. Was it, was, it a, um, was it a comment or was it a, like a statement? I didn't actually catch that part. Was, was it written down? I think it, no, I think it was at a private event in oh, okay. LA, wasn't it? I think he said, I think he, he was at a private like, potentially a fundraiser yeah fact check this because i'm not sure and he said something like he's a dictator yeah look he does tend to make quite offhanded comments he, do he does uh, so like that's why you would have and, and i think it was a private event am i right with yeah. that Clay? because uh, i think if it's a private event you he may have genuinely thought that he was you know under chatham house rules and like which is kind of he knows at this point that. come on like, he knows better than that of course but um does he though well, yeah. <laughs> at a fundraising event, all, all these fundraising events are where people say all their bad stuff. That's right. where Binders of Women from Romney came right. from. Was that what Clinton? So I think, I think, but I think, so. yeah, I think when you get it. into those rooms, you can, and it, you, you know, particularly if it's a situation where Everyone's you're trying just to raise money, around. well, you're trying to create a rapport, right? You're yeah. trying to be like, listen, you guys are the inside people. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, and unless you are very, very vigilant, you can easily say that something that, with hindsight, you wish you hadn't said. Um, and, and I also think that that's a kind of a, it kind of, who knew that it was going to get picked up by the news like that? Like it's not, he's said this before he's called Putin a thug. He's done all this kind of stuff before. Like why? I actually don't even know why it's being picked up that much. Probably because it just came after right. the visit of Blinken and right. his whole, you're going to see tensions ease between right. China and the and US. Then, and I think then Xi Jinping came out and said that, that, that like the Chinese, their foreign came, it, it, spokesperson, that like they need to immediately apologize ooh, otherwise. Right. For, exactly. Yeah, so I, I mean, but yes, he, it's absurd to say that Xi Jinping isn't a dictator. That's, that's not the way you square that circle. I think you can just, you know, say something like, you know, obviously I didn't want those comments out there and I apologize. Mm. Or you don't even have to say that, you just ignore it. If you were advising the Australian prime minister, he, you know he's going to be asked this question, do you think Xi Jinping's a dictator? How would you have yeah, him I would say, say something incredibly boring that's not going to make the news because there's no value in engaging in the question. 
because mm. you don't you can't say no i don't think so because it's not true and you certainly don't want to say i agree because then they go oh okay well we're gonna be upset with you again i think you would just try and say something so boring that no one really knows what you said mm. something along the lines of you know it's not have I'm it be not, really gonna, rambling and yeah i'm not going to comment on you know a fo foreign leader's comments and whether he made them or not it's leaked comments leaked comments you um you know australia has a very you know we're working hard on our relationship with china and we've had a very positive visit recently and thank you very much that's like something you know not yeah. something non-answery like that deflective yeah because there's just no value in getting yeah. it and this and it's also it's it's handbags at five paces all of this stuff like it's just nonsense in my view it doesn't matter it's not that it doesn't matter it's just that it is it, it does matter because people f attach importance to it it's like kind of a self-perpetuating thing it's like it doesn't matter but then people say it matters so it becomes yeah. something that matters hmm. but it the core of it doesn't matter do you think we over focus on ideas instead of the material when it comes to what do you mean politics that? and geopolitics that it's more about what is said rather than actually what's happening in that there's more priority i think put there rather than i do i think that the real work very few people do the work mm. when it comes to global politics P very few people do the research to understand what actually matters and that's because a lot of it's boring it's energy security policy it's supply chains it's you know like all these kinds of things that people fall asleep and you can't write you know a three-line <laughs> folded headline for um that's what is the real driver of international politics and global you know relations um but you know you got to do the work to do that and that's boring we were talking about before we started recording this we talked about like um the idea of kind of fully researching content and fully researching geopolitical content or just being like is it better to just smash out hot takes and get views and, yeah and this is kind of like the legacy media of, version of it yeah, yeah it's just being like oh i called him a dictator <laughs> and it's like that's going to drive clicks but there's no, there's no substance to it. Or like the submarine story that, <sighs> oh my God. I honestly <laughs> didn't even know it was happening until like yesterday or the day before. And I feel very happy that I somehow missed it yeah. because just what a... But what a, like, it's almost like... You're telling one. me that nothing important in the world happened over the days that, that right. was covered nonstop. It's also like, imagine if you have an inbuilt countdown clock on a news story. That's why, <laughs> that's why everyone loves it. Because it was like... Yeah, it's another Four spoiler. days of, for a rescue. You know, it's not like, I mean particularly at the moment with some of like migrant migrants coming from north africa to europe and all of these shipwrecks in which you can immediately like rescue a lot of people yeah although but, uh, oh, yeah, apparently I, I read today that the that the u.s navy knew from the start that there was like Suspected, an implosion yeah. and that this was all yeah for a waste i don't even want to talk about it i just don't i mean it's not that i i don't want to say i don't care because it's obviously a terrible accident but like far enough yeah <laughs> <laughs> out of all the things that matter in the world that was one of those sad events that you know it wouldn't go in international intrigue would it no i don't think so i mean <laughs> maybe in 10 years is like a fun fact or something maybe maybe right it's kind of wild to me still that the titanic is still taking lives right mm. sad anyway sad. uh maybe last question decoupling china the united states you're a china man discuss <laughs> i'm a china man uh what do you want me to discuss about it do you I, think one is it happening no. two is it gonna is it gonna happen no and three why no one it's not possible it's really not like the, the economy is uh you can't unpick globalization fully and that is the probably the most deeply embedded part of globalization is china's uh, integration in the global economy um and two you don't want to because that would cause a hell of a lot of economic pain around the world both to china and to us and to europe and to everyone i uh, think you've seen the like ursula von der leyen is kind of saying now it's like a de-risking kind of strategy with with china not decoupling which i think gets the idea around like let's untangle some of the more key industries like don't have huawei make our 5g networks and don't have you know don't have a massive reliance on china for semiconductors like trailing edge semiconductors and all this kind of stuff but decoupling is impossible and not a good thing we shouldn't want it mm. I, I have a fairly counter take to most people in the china establishment in dc anyway i'm relatively hawkish on china as 
an overall prospect, but I actually think the, the kind of technology ban, the banning the semiconductors and the equipment that the Biden administration did late last year is a bad idea because it makes China less, there's fewer incentives for China not to act belligerently if they don't have connections with the West. So the idea that like they, prior to that, they needed to play ball and be somewhat constructive because they were reliant on American mm -hmm. technology. You've just taken away a bargaining chip now. So why, mm. you've kind of removed a guardrail when it comes to Taiwan. So like I- Although arguably, you know, one of the reasons why they got rid of the advanced, advanced semiconductors is, yeah, is, not, is not just for like, we're worried that um, they're gonna be able to compete with TSMC and Intel. It has to do with supercomputers for nuclear oh, simulation. It's, and it's so- de It's definitely military related, military and intelligence yeah, for sure. And right, you know, as we're seeing with Russia, Ukraine, having thousands of nukes does something that maybe having 300 nukes that China has right now doesn't do. Yeah, I, I think the, yes, that's the, the, the argument. And it's not a bad one. The yeah. idea you don't want your adversary to have leading edge military technology, whatever form that takes. But it still doesn't get around the fact that like, is it better to let, to allow them to continue to develop that and then constructively manage the relationship so that it's a normal kind of arms racey kind of, you know, Soviet Union, America, previous, you know, there's, this isn't the first time we've had two big powers have a military relationship yeah. that's problematic. But when you say, okay, you're not going to have that developed capability, they say, okay, so what, what? literally why wouldn't we invade Taiwan? But then is that not well, just saying that, but then what's the difference between what's we done for the last, say, 20, 30 years when it comes to China? Like, do you think that should just keep staying the same? What do you mean? That you know, largely there shouldn't be a trade war that we should just try to keep relations open with China in the hope that then they will become a... No, no, I don't, I don't think, I think, I think we all understand that they're not going to liberalize and that that's back to reality. But I do think you have to engage construct. I mean, it's, it's like the world as it is versus the world as it should be. You would like to be able to say, oh, we're going to cut China off from all this technology and they're going to just sit there nicely as a third, second tier power, but that's not going to happen. So... You have to deal with the world as it is and the world as it is is that they are going to yeah sure they're not going to develop that technology in the next two years now it looks more like 10. Mm -hmm. they're going to get there eventually i think it then takes off so that's one thing they're going to get there you can't stop it and in the meantime you've made you've given them fewer reasons to engage constructively with you because you've shown that you're willing to weaponize things like tech and trade um you know that's it's not it's not the consensus view in dc so i'm not saying it's like obvious or the answer. I just have a sense that more interreliance is a good thing. I don't think that it's the idea of like, the old, oh, it will, China will come into the fold. They'll become, that's how wars never get fought between democracies because everyone's too yeah. tied together. I think that's, we, we know that's not fully true. What, what do you think, sorry to interrupt, not at all. What, what do you think about the idea of like places like Malaysia and Indonesia and India are are kind of going to steal China's thunder for like cheap labor and manufacturing. Like I kind of, I'm kind of starting to take that view. I used to think maybe like China was going to rival the U S at some point in terms of maybe not like global power projection, but like they were going to be able to sort of influence their sphere more heavily than the U S. But I think potentially like, like China's in the start of a democratic, Demographic crisis, is it not? Yeah, what about the 150 million people Peter that are missing that, Peter? Uh, let's yeah, talk about right. yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's all of those things. I don't think it's either or. I think China will be able to project influence in its region. Of course, it's a big country and its military is growing incredibly quickly and getting more sophisticated every day. Uh, and I think also that when we when I said de-risking, I think that's what de-risking is. It's like they're not people aren't going to be able to pull their supply chains and not do business entirely with China, but they will just say, okay, well, let's not have 80% of our mm. supply chain exposed to China. Let's make it 40% and go to Indonesia or India. Like you see Apple doing that already, right? Yeah. Um, but Apple's also not going to completely be able to get out of China. Well, not anytime soon anyway. Maybe they will in like five, 10 years or something. But yeah, I think by what, next year or the year after they want 25% of their iPhones made in India, which right. is actually quite a lot. That's quite a lot, yeah. What, Elon what Musk was. just said that Tesla's gonna be coming to India soon yeah so well that, that's also because india has a lot of tight regulations in terms like the taxes on imported stuff or it's made in india is huge. such it's like double the price yeah and so that's why you then do, you do a bit in india and you go to vietnam and you do a bit in indonesia and like that's that de-risking idea of 
the, the world as it goes forward will be very much one, I think, dominated by hedging strategies of like, we don't, volatility's up, we don't know what we're gonna do, so let's spread it out a bit. We'll you know, concentrate maybe in the most cost-effective or most strategic place, but we can't put all our eggs in that basket anymore. That's, I think, what de-risking means to me anyway. Um, and also with, oh, I don't know, with Tesla, but Musk, you can't believe a thing he says, like in both directions. So I think, yeah. It seems like they had a pretty productive meeting, like Musk and, um, was it Modi. Modi? Modi, yeah. I don't know. I just got the impression that I think, I don't know, Musk, he has relations with China, doesn't he? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got a gigafactory in Shanghai. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, yeah. I, I honestly, like, and this is not me taking a shot at Musk, you know, he's an incredible individual but like you just there's nothing that he says that i would put any faith in and i mean that in both directions i don't mean he's lying but i mean like he he plays different games with his pr like, hey the tesla roadster is going to come out in 2019 or whatever i'm so go. glad i paid the entire amount in advance did you no <laughs> but someone did <laughs> someone, a lot of people some, lot did of people and gave them free it. loans a lot of people did i know yeah last question speaking of hedging in the news macron mm. The French foreign minister says that France wants an invite to the BRICS summit. What's you, France You're hitting up me to? with stuff that I haven't heard because I haven't read the news today. Um, yeah. what, what, did they, what did Macron say? Uh, the French foreign minister said, here we go. How do you think Macron understands the future more than some- From Politico, leaders? wait. He's smart. He is a smart do, dude. Do, do you want to read just the second and third paragraph, Ross? Mm -hmm. So Emmanuel Macron wants to take his one-man global diplomacy to another level. The French president <laughs> wishes Politico. to become the first Western leader to be invited to a BRICS summit. Foreign Minister Catherine Colonna, summit French, set, uh, oh, wait, now it's changed size, uh, said late Monday. <laughs> We're reading the third paragraph or? Uh, might as well. Having a having a dialogue is always positive, even when we don't hundred percent agree on everything. I think that's pretty much far enough. Yep. I think I think Macron. It, this is very much like I think I think he understands like where the world's heading more so than other leaders. Um, not a big fan because of uh, obviously French, like British, like I, I don't know. Still, still really they're, litigating ten sixty six. Well, they're kind kind of that, and then a bit of like <laughs> I don't know. Like some sometimes the French, like especially over Brexit, like the French haven't been the most like amicable. Them sort of. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, this but, is not just Macron continuing his whole like the European Union needs strategic autonomy yeah, and. That's what it is. But is there buy-in anywhere else, or is this just like Macron? It, you know, I've spoken to some people, and they're like, "This is just Macron's like dream, and no one else is really on board with it." Some people say that um, it might be different. Yeah, I, it's hard. It's hard to kind of answer that because you know, the U.S. view is they would not like that to happen. The Chinese view is they would like that very much to happen. Europe's view, I think, is kind of stuck between both, other than Macron, obviously, because you know I, it's not stupid for Macron to play this idea. Like he, he's, he's. I agree with you. He's ahead of most other world leaders and really engaging with the idea that the world's going to be multipolar. That. Mm there isn't going to be an America versus China. It's going to be Brazil and India and Turkey and these countries kind of being like, well, well, sometimes we'll partner with you, sometimes we'll partner with you, but we're going to do what's best for us and the region. And I think Macron is kind of saying the more like powerful polls we have that generally are democratic, Western aligned, little L liberal, the better. So why don't we create another one yeah we're not always going to agree with america but we are largely going to agree with america there's too much cultural stuff there for europe to become you know europe's not going to turn into russia anytime mm. soon so i think well, he's saying like actually the world it would be more stable if we but if we are that third pole fourth pole of power the us are kind of going we need more people in absolute lockstep with us to confront china like it, it helps america for it to be more bipolar than yeah, well, I think I think the Americans like kind of wanted the war in Ukraine. If you ask me, it's because it splits basically Europe. Like, you think they now, wanted it? Well, I think I think they part like there was interest okay. there for it to for it to to happen because now we're completely reliant basically on America. Like we don't import do you, Russian do you gas anymore. I'll just become high for a second. Do you have a view on that? Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Did the United States want it? They wanted it more than the alternative to prevent war. They weren't willing to, I think especially after Afghanistan, pull NATO hardware back to the 1997 borders to rule out Ukraine and Georgia and 
any other country from ever joining NATO to remove their nuclear weapons from Europe and everything else that Russia demanded. Mind you, in like a multi-week span. So who knows if the Russian demands were really all that credible or just a, a way to cause war. Although I think arguably, if there was Minsk too and sort of the United States withdrawal basically from Europe, um, that that could have stopped the war. And I, I just think for the US that was not acceptable and they were willing to to risk it for the biscuit. Hey, I think maybe not, maybe want is a yeah, bit yeah, of a I, strong word, right, but like, like it was like, oh, it's happening. A happy consequence. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think that the US genuinely did a lot of work to try and prevent it happening before in the lead up to it, right? Like there was a lot of private warnings to Russia that- But they were, but they were warnings. They weren't willing to well, sort of reach before, Russian demands. Well, Oh no, like no, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, like no, that's, I feel like that's- Or not, like the Finlandization of Ukraine, like all those things were off the table. Right, I think that's exactly, so yeah. yes, in the sense of like, I think there was an idea of, we're not gonna negotiate to prevent you invading because you've threatened to invade. You can't conduct global affairs by like every time a country decides that like, oh, well, we might invade, oh, what do you need? What do you want? Don't do it. But I do think that, like, I, do, I do think that they didn't want Russia to invade. Like I don't, I think that I've seen like folks out there being like, you know, they they goaded Russia into it and they like- Mearsheimer? Right, tricked them into it because it's a very helpful place to have a war. It's like, get out of here. Like, I don't the US think, would much rather be in the Indo-Pacific right now full time rather than dealing with this. Yeah, I think that they- like, uh, And uh, also like, it, it also assumes that the United States policymakers, maybe they're all evil, are okay with just what's like, what's ha like, even if Ukraine wins, depending on how long this war comes out, will ukraine survive afterwards like they would take uh totally and don't forget america spent a lot of its taxpayers money defending fairly ungrateful europeans <laughs> in a way uh which i think I, if i was an american i'd be pretty upset yeah. about not not in the sense that i don't think they should do it but i'd be pretty irritated when you have like some countries in europe being like no get out of here we don't like you, you know and they don't pay for their military they get to spend on the health care then they talk bad about us exactly i would be irritated but i also think that there was a very real pervasive thought amongst every Western military that Russia would be able to decapitate Ukraine in a week, maybe a month. Uh, and they didn't want that to happen. And then mm -hmm. when it didn't happen, because Russia, as we now know, is entirely incompetent and riddled with corruption and, you know. And the US did plan the defense of Kyiv. That came out afterwards. Yeah, I think that they were they were kind of like, oh, okay, we actually have a foothold here, and that's where I think you might be saying, mm -hmm. like, now that this has happened, it is definitely in our interest to fully oh, yeah. get behind Ukraine and fight a vaguely proxy war. Um, vaguely. Well, I, I think it is vaguely because I think it, a proxy war is kind of much more nefarious. This is genuinely helping mm. a country defend its sovereignty. It's a so, like, I don't think a proxy war is kind of like being like, oh, let's stoke problems in a third country so that we can have a fight with Russia in say Chad versus yeah. we're gonna support a, a sovereign country from being invaded. But I think it does help. But in a way also like, why is that wrong? Like that, that, that's exactly what the Western alliances should be doing. A country, sovereignty, international law, all the stuff that the Western liberal world order maintains, that was violated by a country very nakedly that's what we have been spending money on defense and building for uh, 85 years since World War II. There are consequences when you do that. These are the consequences. We get. We all come together and we defend. Mm. I, I, I don't really get the kind of conspiracy stuff about like, oh, this is, America's very happy about this because it you know increases. Or that Boris Johnson went to Ukraine in what, like April to say, don't sign the peace deal. I don't doubt that Boris Johnson went to Ukraine and told Zelensky, I don't think you should sign it. But also at that time, 88% of Ukrainians was said that they did not want to concede any territory, even if it that's meant Zelensky, that the fighting- And that's Zelensky driving. That, that was right? going to go. No, it actually, I mean, if you look at pre-war, no one likes Zelensky. No, I mean, but it's like Zelensky's messaging has been from the start. We will not give in while Russian remains on our soil. Yeah. Like, I don't think that- But I think it's also because that's the popular Ukrainian opinion right. too. Of course. And, and if you were to give up, then does, is there a revolt against the Ukrainian government? And right. then in that case, that's a really good opportunity just to- restart the war that totally. you totally I, I think the, the so i think if you're if, if i'm taking the argument of like this is good for america at its kind of like most generous there might be an argument that it's better for the war to drag on and keep russia engaged 
I don't, I still don't think that's true because I think America would like it to be over sooner rather than later, as long as the conditions that Russia, you know, all those things like withdraws. But yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like also a lot of people can overthink this stuff. Like at the end of the day, governments are just like us. They react to things mm. as they happen. They make the best decisions, sometimes not even the best decisions <laughs> based on the evidence they have. And then things change and you have to make different decisions. But yeah, I don't know. I. I, I'm, I, I worry though that this will become a very protracted long war. I don't see any incentive for Russia to stop it while well, they have Chinese backing. And mm -hmm. Next question. One more. One more. Yeah, then I've got to run. Ross, do you want it? I think we we started on the topic of Macron. Like, yeah, like I say, I think he does. He, oh, yeah. like, he, he um, what did you think about the European political community? Because I think Macron realizes like the EU is kind of the brakes have been very much jammed on when it comes to like new countries joining and sort of increased federalism. Um, and like if you look at the election results across Europe, like the, the Swedes have just got their most right wing government. Mm. Like Germany's on course to have like a right wing government. Like Finland's now. Yeah. I think I think he understands that like Europe's the, it's fro like it's frozen. Like the Brits have we've left. I think this, I think he, like, it, what I'm trying to say is it plays in, like, the, the European political community was kind of, like, meant to include Russia, I think, and, and places like Bosnia, Herzegovina, like, former mm. Balkan states. Like, what, what do you make of, like, his, I think it, what I'm trying to ask is, like, yeah, what, let's continue on the topic of, like, what mm. do you think Macron? I, I, I'm not an expert in EU politics at all. So no. I, I think, but I do think, I don't know if it's Macron's view or just generally the EU political leaders' view that the EU is fairly fragile. Mm. There are, I mean, rightly so. There's just like America. There's like 50 states in America, many of which disagree with each other. There's how many states in the EU? Like 29, 30, something like that? I think it's 27 now. Okay, there you go. Yeah, A lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one less than it was in before yeah. 2016 anyway. Um, but I feel like it's fairly fragile, right? I think they understand yeah. that. They, As you just said, Hungary is you know, problematic to the Europeans. Very well, they, they actually, the European Commission, I think, have just said that they want to put, they basically want to distribute migrants across the EU. Mm -hmm. And Poland of Hungary have said, we're not having it. And Poland have now said that they are going to have a referendum on that policy. Yeah. So like, whether like people are saying, like in the sort of hypey, like we were talking about earlier, it's like, oh, Poland might leave the EU. Mm. But, I mean, it's unlikely to happen, but like it is on the, Kind of on the table. Well, I mean, me. with all due respect to your country, I think that that has become a very useful political weapon to threaten it, right? Like, yeah. like we'll leave, we'll leave if you don't give us what you want. Um, and before it was unthinkable, but now the seal's been broken. So right. Who knows? If Britain can do it, then Poland anyone can. can. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's tough. I, I genuinely think that people don't make the comparison to America enough. America is essentially a union of states that could all be, well, many of them could be their own countries, particularly, you know, California was like, what, the seventh biggest, eighth biggest economy in the world. But it just happens to be in a much longer and more durable union. But there was a civil war. There was, you know, it's not. But we don't think of it the same way. Really, Europe is a giant super state with lots of disagreeing factions inside it. And you've got to cont continually work at the internal politics to make sure it sticks together. Yeah. And I think that there's a, I think they recognize, I think everyone, rec well, maybe they don't. I think they recognize it and the outside world kind of sees the EU as like a country. Mm. It's, not, it's not. No, it's. I mean, it's not technically, and it's not even in its conception. It's a loose alliance of countries that kind of have a vague sense of Europeanness, whatever that means. I mean, arguably, NATO is more of a country than the EU. Just in, if you look in terms of like the military front. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, Spain has more in common with Mexico than it does with probably like you know some of the Eastern European countries. So there's all there's. It's just one of those things that I think people. Again, it's complex. People don't like to do the work of understanding these issues. I think Macron genuinely understands Europe. I think he understands both that Europe is far stronger together. And I'm talking, you know, individually, these countries don't get a seat at any table with the exception of Germany and France. Well, Europe's not, I think this is something that Europeans and like even British people like will have to come to terms with. It's not the center of the world anymore. It's not. It's like someone said, sorry, to, someone not said the other day that something that resonated with me, it's like the UK is practically like, no offense to Poland, because I think it's a great country, but Poland with Singapore tacked on in yeah. London. Well, so. I think uh, again, the 51st state. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Geez. Do you think it'll happen? 
No, oh. <laughs> I don't mean to offend anyone, but I think that's right. Brit- like yeah. British Britain is absent its P five status and absent its nuclear weapons, is a declining and yeah. increasingly irrelevant country. Um, you know, I think Macron understands that about Europe too. Like, yeah. if Europe is to remain important, it has to stay together and it has to potentially become a third pole. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't. I'm certainly not a European expert, but it, I, I'll be honest. I think. I think that the problem really is that you will all in democratic countries, you always have opportunistic politicians who want sound bites, want exposure, and there will always be work in saying we're leaving, we're breaking up, we're mm-hmm. doing all this kind of stuff, short termism over long termism. But if any if you went to any kind of senior civil servant in any of those countries, I <laughs> guarantee you they'd be like, No, of course Europe is an important thing and we should be in Europe. <laughs> I don't know if that was your question, but no. <laughs> well, it just I think I don't know. It kind of, kind of like you say, Macron. He just he knows it. Like the European political community, which includes the UK, and like it just seems like it. He know, yeah. I, don't he, know. I think he gets it. I get, yeah. He gets a modern Europe in his bones. I think. Whereas I think a lot of potentially like older politicians have a different conception of Europe. Yeah, I think he understands the mo- the, the future of modern Europe is to be a diplomatic and economic powerhouse but for that to be true it needs to be fairly strong together yep john fowler thank you so much yeah, oh nice. wait what's your favorite newsletter to read oh it's uh international intrigue yes i'm the founder <laughs> of international intrigue for anyone who's unaware of that um which is a daily five minute geopolitical newsletter kind of think morning brew times the economist that's that's what we, how we pitch it um international tr- intrigue.io highly recommended thank you that's internationalintrigue.io. John, that thanks is. so much. Real pleasure.